Hello, everybody, and welcome to the midweek program here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. We are situated here on the roof of our Ruby McSwain Education Act. You know what? My name is Blake. I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. We're here on the roof of the Ruby McSwain Education Center, and we pulled together a preview for an auction that we've got going on that is affiliated with our winter symposium that's going on this weekend. So we've got plants up here that we're gonna show you and tell you all about. But before we get into that, I just wanna let y'all know about some programs we've got going on at the Arboretum here in the near future. And with announcements out of the way, we can get started with our preview of the plant auctions. I've got it set up. I've got external speakers here so that if any of you have any questions about the plants that they're talking about, feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt with your questions. They'll be able to hear them. They'll be able to ask them then and there. If you don't want to unmute yourself, you can drop the question in the chat and I can interrupt them for you, but we are not going to wait around. If we move on, we move on. So your question might get lost. So might as well unmute yourself and join in the fun. Um, and so with that, let's... What do we got coming on with our auction coming up? Okay, we have lots of exciting things and I think the auction went live today. It did, at noon. At, at noon, so if you haven't looked, look. Things are gonna go really quickly, they, they tend to do. Um, if you are an aggressive bidder, get ready because there'll be other ones doing the same thing. So we picked some of our favorites um, to talk about today. And uh, if you look at the table, Tim has more than me. Um, he talks fast and he knows more about these plants than I do. So I picked purposely ones that I knew a little bit something about. I don't know if I know more. I, I can make up some things. Pretty I can make up some things too. So yeah. we might make up some things as we, as we go along. So I'm gonna start with the tall one so we can get it off the table. I've got two maples up here. This is Acer oblongum. And uh, little did I know, um, and I remember looking at this in the nursery, this is evergreen for me in Charlotte and uh, also evergreen for my colleagues at Atlanta Botanic Garden. So here it's, uh, it's semi-deciduous, it's lost all of its leaves. But the thing about this maple that I like a lot, um, native to Asia, it's, it's relatively unique. If you are a plant collector, this is one that you should definitely have. The new growth is kind of a rose pinkish color, which is interesting, but it's a really, really nice, unusual maple for, um, for your garden. Uh, medium growing, doesn't take up a lot of space, but again, a true kind of plant collector plant. Sun to part shade does better in moist, well-drained soil, as most maples do. But um, I have learned through places I've worked and ones that I've grown that it's pretty soil adaptable. But if you are a fan of maples, this is one I think you should add to, to the list of ones that you have in, in your garden. Yeah, here in the garden, we have two still in the garden. They're quite large and they are tardily deciduous. They hold leaves yeah. into the first of the year typically. Yep. And then when we had that actual cold spell in December, I'm guessing that made them all fall off. Yep. Uh, we've also in the past, we've had one that wanted to be evergreen and it only ever got about three feet tall and would lose six or six to 12 inches of growth each year. <laughs> it got smaller and smaller. So the deciduous ones are great for us, but the, the ones that want to be evergreen can be a challenge. So that one should do well here regardless of where it's at. Yep. Tag team, you're it. Okay, so this is a um, Acer Negundo Winter Lightning. And it's one a local nursery plan uh, found here, Pat McCracken. And um, so this isn't your typical um, box elder. It, it has gold stems through the, uh, all year long actually, but uh, you don't notice them as much in the, the summer because they're covered up. But a great one, you can cut it back periodically and you'll get a fresh new growth on it. And you can pollard this, you can yeah. stool it, let it get big. The, the more you cut it back, the brighter yeah. that foliage is. So um, it's very aptly named uh, Winter Lightning. We got a bunch of these from a nursery friend of mine and actually planted a big sweep of them, kind of like you would do with a, um, the colored twig dogwoods. So that will have a big impact. This was at another garden that I worked at. But again, looking for that winter interest, that multiple season of interest. I love this plant for this. Because it is a, a box elder, um, very fast growing, soil adaptable, box elders in, in their native habitat will grow where it's wet or where it will flood. So this one is very soil adaptable. If you've got heavy clay, I think it'll do fine. Um, does best in full sun, but I definitely would grow this uh, to cut it back in the, in the winter time for that. When did, how big did yours get each year when, when you drew them? Um, we would cut this back like every 
other year. Okay. So we'd let them get about this big okay. and cut them to the ground if that new growth would come up. We had a couple just grown as trees and it's attractive, but the older growth yeah. turns like a regular maple wood. So you don't get that, that color. The coloration is on the, the newer, newer stems. Um, it can take that pruning. It can kind of take that abuse. Yes. Um, uh, you let it grow into a mature tree then they start to kind of fall apart and have We didn't problems. get ours falling apart, but I chopped it down a couple of years ago and it was 35, 40 feet tall when I cut it down. Yep. And it's reflushed back up, no problem. Uh, and we have nice new uh, stems on there. Great tree. So I have a bunch of different stuff over here. And actually the first one I'm gonna talk about is this one here. Uh, this is Diospyrus texana. So this is a Texas persimmon. And I find this one really cool. This doesn't look like much. I'm gonna set it here, but hopefully, uh, Alexander can get back here. This is a mature specimen I've had planted on the roof here since 2007. It was planted actually a little bit bigger than that, not much. It was in a gallon pot when I planted it there. And the bark on it is spectacular. It's tardily deciduous, um, much like that Acer oblongum. If we have a warm winter, it will hold some of its leaves. If we have a cold winter, it loses them all. I looked, it's not, <laughs> nothing's dead on there. I actually scratched it to make sure. It, the buds are tiny. Um, beautiful tr uh, tree though. In the wild, they get 10 to 15 feet tall. That's in Texas, and I don't know how long that takes. But uh, this is only like a, about eight feet tall is what I'm guessing there, and maybe 10 feet wide. Um, after, oh, uh, 16 years, so in the ground. Um, but a wonderful plant, you don't get a chance to uh, get too often. If you have multiples of them and you happen to get a boy and a girl, because they are dioecious, you can get fruit that is theoretically edible, uh, but you have to peel it because the rind is not too, the skin's not too tasty from what I understand, like you would uh, with our native um, persimmons as well. But they're not very big, only about an inch. And I'm thinking if you've had to peel the inch fruit, I do get some fruit on here, but I don't, they never get much bigger than my, the tip of my thumb. There's better um, things to eat. Yes, much better, but grow it for its structure and bark is what I like it for, so. And it'll, it's actually fairly adaptable. It doesn't have to be growing in uh, the conditions I have up here on the roof, so. In Texas, where this grows native, it grows in lean soil. So that lends itself well to our gardens, our landscapes. And again, it's not something that you see very often. Um, this is something to keep your eye on if you're one of those aggressive uh, bidders and are looking for something, something unusual. So another one I have here is a personal uh, favorite of mine, partly because I, uh, along with a uh, former coworker, uh, found this one actually growing here in the Arboretum as a mutation. Uh, it doesn't look like much right now, but it does have some flower buds on it. Uh, this is Stachyrus, um, I, are we calling it Praycox or not? No, we're just calling it uh, Stachyrus Carolina Parakeet. Uh, it's a mutation from a white and green leafed one. So it has a, uh, a central green splash on a white leaf um, that was magpie. And this one's different. It has a green edge and it has a chartreuse green uh, or yellowy green down through this, um, the middle of the, the leaf. And also the leaf petiole has some red pigmentation in it. And um, so, hence Carolina parakeet, our extinct parrot from here in the Southeastern United States. Um, and the coloration, I thought it was very appropriate. Uh, to add to that foliage, uh, as this matures, you get flower buds and it's difficult to propagate this thing because it, all, it goes immediately to uh, producing next year's flower buds for as soon as it's done flowering. So there's never good uh, material to take cuttings of, but uh, this has some short ones on it this year, but um, they'll get actually probably six to eight inches long when they're full expanded and it looks like a mature plant looks like a bead curtain when it's in full flower in March. So uh, one of my favorite plants here in the garden and for multiple reasons, not just that I found it. This is the plant that when I would visit here before I came here and I knew that it was blooming, this is the first place in the garden that I would go because it is a, it is a favorite. It's one of those kind of showstopper plants, doesn't look like much through most of the year. But when this thing is flowering, it really is, is, is jaw dropping and pulls you right to it. A, a great plant for a mixed border because it doesn't look like much throughout much, most of the year, but when it's in flower, man, it's, it's something to see. Another thing with this, I've noticed, we have several other stachyuris in the garden. Some are already in flower they get zapped in the uh, mm -hmm. each year. This waits and flowers a little bit later, a couple weeks later, and it, I've not had any foliar dam or flower damage on these. So it misses out on a lot of early or late freezes, however you look at it uh, too, so. Great plant.
I'm gonna talk about uh, one that is kind of a favorite to me, but not for a lot of people. <laughs> Um, when you think about barberry, most people turn their nose up. They have thorns on them. Uh, they have prickly personalities. This is Berberus wilsonii, Staphiana uh, is the variety. Um, Berberus wilsonii, it's about four to five feet tall. This variety is a little bit taller than the, the straight species. Um, I love the blue-green foliage on this. The new growth can be kind of orangey red to pink and it's soft until it kind of hardens off in the, the late spring, early summer. Really, really nice texture in the garden. It's one of my favorite, um, favorite Berberis. Doesn't look like much right now once they get their legs underneath it. Kind of a nice, kind of delicate mound, kind of foams over itself. But one of my favorite um, uh, deciduous shrubs for, for the, the border adds a lot of, lot of interest and um, we'll hold on to its leaves into the, into the winter in, in, in most locations. But uh, buyer beware, it, it does have thorns yeah. on it. That one's been evergreen for us. And then they also have nice little um, dangling yellow florets, yes. uh, little uh, spikes, kind of like a Mahonia, but don't yep. word chaser. Same, same family. Tip, tip the Barberry family, the Berberidaceae. So let's see, who else do I have here? Here's another one. You may have, this is, um, Eerie Betrayer Japonica White Splash. Apparently we got this from Chicory Nursery, which is in Japan. So, yep. so um, you can't see it too much on this yet, but this uh, is a really cool loquat. And it is, it's been evergreen forest. It's been slower growing than the standard green form. The new growth, which there, if you could see real close here, I don't know if Alexander can get it or not. There is some um, flecks of white on it right now. Um, and it's, it's apparent when it first comes up and it is, it still holds for a little bit for a month or so after it's expanded. Um, and then the leaves will ultimately turn green after that. So you get this succession of color on it. Uh, when it flushes, um, you get a flush and then it uh, hardens off and then you get another flush and, uh, with the, the green on it. Our plant's five or six feet tall now. And I think, is this 2011? Yeah, so we've had it since 2011. And I did torture it, I have to, if I remember <laughs> right, in the nursery before I actually got it in the ground. So it hasn't been in the ground that long, uh, maybe six or eight years, but um, it's starting to grow for us. It's a nice, coarse, broadleaf evergreen shrub. You see this a lot down in South Carolina. I remember my, some of my trips to Aiken um, and Bob McCartney at Woodlanders had a lot of these growing down there. They look good in a mass because of that, that really coarse texture to it. But um, like Tim said, this one, that new growth has those interesting kind of white flecks in it. And again, this is another one of those things that you're not gonna find no. anywhere else, but um, someplace like, like this. And um, if it, I, I haven't, ours hasn't flowered yet, but if it flowers, the, I love the fragrance of um, Iribitraya and it's in November and December. And it's this baby powder-like fragrance. Oh. And then if you're real lucky enough and they set fruit, we'll get small fruit on them that are, my interns like to eat in the spring. So, <laughs> um, in the first of, uh, the end of May, first of June. So. Okay, since you got more. I have more, have I more. know, I always have more. Uh, this is another one you were mentioned that you had someone who wanted this. This is Parodiopsis, uh, <laughs> darn, I'm just blanking, Jack Montiana. Um, and I was looking up, I didn't realize, and it makes sense. I knew it was in the uh, witch hazel family. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this gets a yellow inflorescence of multiple little flowers and there's white bracts around it. Kind of looks like a dogwood when it's in flower. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't hit me. This is next in the same uh, subfamily as the Father Gillis. Yes. So it's in, so it made sense. I just noticed that today and now that makes more sense as to the way the flower or the inflorescence is on it. But uh, about a, it's eight to 10 foot tall shrub probably. And we've had one in the garden for decades. Um, and longer than I've been here. And, um, and I've always like it, it flowers in actually probably in March, the end of this month or March, it'll be in flower. Uh, so, but it, it's very different. It kind of has the structure of a witch hazel, but then you have these like dogwood like um, inflorescences on it. Um, so it, it's an interesting one and you don't see it. No, another, another plant collector plant. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, several years ago you would see that some specialty growers um, you always see it in, in some botanical gardens and the like, and it gains interest and then falls kind of by the wayside. But it's one of those things that once you see it, once you see a mature one and start to learn about it, it kind of, uh, kind of gains some, some favor out in the, out in the world. And I was also reading that the, the, the things they torture, they, they make things out of the wood. It's like, why would you waste it and make, <laughs> make a, a handle, uh, <laughs> a bed frame? That was the other things they said out of it. So. 
Or rope out of the twigs. No, <laughs> or, ornamental use only. Yeah. All right, this is a, another plant collector plant, um, Emenopterus henryi. And I'm gonna read a description um, that best, fit, best suits what this, this tree is. Um, I was reading up about this. Um, this was discovered by E.O. Wilson on a plant exploration trip to, to China many, many years ago. I think he brought it through the, the Arnold Arboretum. Um, another unique kind of weird plant. Michael Durr says, um, this incites the unfulfilled passions of the fanatical plant collector. And I think that's a good way to kind of sum, sum this up. Um, if you ever see this thing in flower, you will swoon and you'll have to have it in your garden. Um, white kind of waxy bell-shaped flowers, fragrant white bracts that kind of surround that. The Achilles heel of this, um, two of them, it's hard to find, nobody grows it. It's relatively easy to grow. I think these were yeah. seedlings. No, those are actually like, cuttings off of suckers on our Cuttings the, off the of suckers off of ours. Um, I've got colleagues at Atlanta Botanic Garden that have grown it the same way. Um, it usually takes a long time yeah. for this to flower, um, anywhere from 10 to 30 years. So um, I, I've mentioned in the past, you have to be patient to be a gardener. Definitely so with this. That said, we had some seedlings of this that we got from Atlanta Botanic Garden when I was in Charlotte and um, some young seedlings that have been into the ground probably less than 10 years. Um, they flowered last year. Cool, so a little more precocious. I completely missed it, so very, very precocious. Um, again, not to beat a dead horse, but if you are a plant collector, this is something to keep your eye on and bid. It's not something that you're going to find, but it's a very, very uh, unique tree. A lot of plantsmen say this is one of their most unique and favorite plants that they've, they've ever seen. You see this a lot in older English gardens. Um, there's a nice one on the campus of Swarthmore College. We've got a, one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen. Um, Atlanta, um, a former gardening friend of mine who was a member of Magnolia Society, was the person that got me excited about this. Um, Willis Harding, who had a really nice garden down in Commerce, Georgia. It's a really unique plant and a, and a sentimental favorite of mine. And being that it's grown from root suckers, it, these some of them actually the suckers had been flowering. So I, we're hoping that these might not take forever to flower. Yeah. Hey Tim, uh, so, we got a question. What conditions does this one take? I mean, it becomes actually a 40 or 50 foot tall tree. You can put it in full sun uh, and it'll be fine. It'll take shade, part, half shade too. It's behind our uh, necessary in reality. Uh, but uh, I know one of our volunteers has one in her yard uh, here in actually three or four miles up the road here. And it flowered several years ago, but she has it along her driveway in, in light shade at most. And it, it's, it's a beautiful tree. All the ones that I've seen in gardens are in, are in light to, to mid shade, but they, they can take full sun. The one that's on the campus of Swarthmore College has got to read them. That, that's in a lot of sun. Um, the ones I've seen in English gardens are, are in sun. Moist, well-drained soil, yeah. most trees like that. Um, who, who wouldn't? But um, this is something that if you got it, I, I wouldn't put it, um, you know, in a, in a harsh situation, yeah. I'd give it some, some TLC to encourage it to, to live and, 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 and stay, stay around. Okay, my next one is this Abutilon. And a friend of ours, <clears throat> a plants person, uh, Dan Hinckley, this is one of his selections from his garden. Last summer I had the opportunity to be out and, um, and visit Dan and in his garden. And we had lunch with Dan and we sat and on either side of us there were seedlings of uh, abutilons that he had sitting there. And this is one of the selections he made from those seedlings he has scattered throughout his garden. Uh, this is Wincliffe, which is the name of his uh, garden, silver pink, which to me it's kind of a salmony pink. Um, or, or they say soft pink, but I like I think more salmon. Oh, we knocked the flower <laughs> off, but that's okay. Um, it will flower more. That's the great thing about abutilons. Yep. They flower for so long. Um, they can be grown as house plants for some of those who are not in as warm a climate as here. So perfect for that. Wonderful summer containers. Yep. But uh, most of them we're finding are hardy here in uh, the area. And I want to I want to I got a couple other ones from out there as well. But I want to we're going to plant them and see how hardy these are for us. If they'll take our summers versus a little differently than out there or not, uh, and that they take the winters. Uh, so I'm, I have a feeling this will act as a dieback perennial for us, but um, if it, uh, we have mild winters, it'll probably be a small shrub. And uh, I really uh, look forward to trying this one in the garden myself. So but we have a couple cuttings that we were able to take from the plant I brought back, so. 
this is a, I'm, I'm with Tim on this. I've not seen one of these that I don't like, and I'd love to get a bunch of them here and, and see how they do. Great in containers, um, just a really interesting Sun, half plant. shade, they're not picky. No. Once they're established, they're drought tolerant yep. too. And, cold, and mostly can be cold tolerant. Do you want to do another one of yours? Uh, or you you have go. Two? I only have two okay. left. Uh, okay. Um, this is another one. Um, this is um, a, a utilitarian shrub here. Um, <laughs> but this is a really special form of it. This is here in the garden. We have one that JC selected. This is Viburnum awabuki uh, variety odoratissima. The selection we have here at the garden is called uh, Chindo. And that's one JC selected on from uh, a hedgerow at a school on Chindo Island in Korea in the early 80s. Um, uh, but this is one that we got from Ozzy Johnson in um, Georgia, and he got this from, I think, Dr. Yokoi in, Jap uh, in Japan. And it has beautiful, stable, marginal variegation. A lot of our variegated plants aren't that good. And I don't know if I've, I can't think of any other really good variegated Viburnum. viburnums. And if this does half as well as Chindo does in our climate, this is going to be a really cool plant. Um, and we just have some small cuttings of this that we were able to get from uh, Ozzy. And this is one of them. So I don't know where else you'll get this one. Uh, again, Unless you go to Japan. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I've been lucky to visit Japan and nurseries and you see these there quite a bit. I don't think the deer eat this. No, um, I've we, had we had a lot of hedges in, in Charlotte and other places. It's a great alternative to some of the things that are used for shrubs. And if you get that kind of coloration on something, again, you're, this is not something that you're going to see any place. Um, put this one on your list to, to bid aggressively for because um, it's going to go quickly. Um, Do you know but, if it gets as large as Shindo? I don't know. I would guess not. It yeah. would probably take a lot longer. And I'm guessing this probably is going to want partial shade. Uh, I don't think it could take the full sun, uh, but I could be wrong. Like like the Shindo, it's got really thick leaves, which makes me think it might be kind of drought yeah. tolerant like, like uh, the, the true species. But I would err on the side of caution with this. And because of that variegation, give it a little bit of protection from, from the hot blasting sun in, in our neck of the woods. Griffin's asking, how large is large? Uh, Chindo for us has gotten about 20 feet tall yeah. and about uh, 12 to 15 feet wide, but I would expect maybe eight to 10 is my guess on that. That I wouldn't go much, much bigger than that with, with that one. Best um, guess. With correct pruning, you can keep them in bounds, yeah. but something like that, I would give the room so you have all yeah. that, all that, all that color. I'm going to go. Uh, sure. Do Do oh, no. Not fragrant flowers on that kind of viburnum. This is this is one where. Or I don't think it has a good fragrance. I, I don't. It might be fragrant based on the odoratissima, but what odor could be the more opt word there? Yeah. Maybe and not fragrant and pleasantly. Odor might be the the foliage. I've never noticed uh, the straight species that have much much fragrance. The flowers seem like they're. Sterile. A lot in in general, the viburnums. Most of them, the ones that are evergreen, tend to stink. Yes. Uh, and the ones that uh, like the uh, some of the winter, late winter, early spring flowering ones might have good fragrance that are totally deciduous uh, so the Burke Woody eyes and Carlesi eye selections but most of the others <clears throat> a fly might pollinate them and, and why would you need flowers when you have that that great yes. foliage they kind of get lost and they're in the, not in the much yeah there. not much if it did flower and set fruit the fruit could be really cool uh, red fruit off of that, that would be that would be amazing well. that would be amazing all right I've got two Daphne's here this is Odora Nakufu and this one's growing bonkers in the lath house right now um, smells absolutely spectacular. It's one of those things that lures you to the garden no matter where it is. This is a variegated selection. Um, Daphne's tend to be a bit finicky. The um, odoras, for me anyway, over my, my experience, are a little less finicky mm. for whatever reason, although I have seen these die for no apparent reason. Don't give um, them excess water. Don't give them excess water. <laughs> um, once you plant them, leave them alone. Don't make direct eye contact with them <laughs> yeah. at certain times of the day. Um, shower them with love and affection and, and kind words. But it's such a great plant because of the fragrance, because of the time of the year right now. Um, if you come visit us, go straight to the Lath House. There's several different ones blooming in there and it's well worth the, the walk through. You'll smell it before you see it. <clears throat> but if you are a gardener, 
and you're gardening for multiple season of interest, Daphne is um, a plant to, to add to your palette of, of things that you use. Um, another plant that I've not met a species or cultivar that I, that I don't like, just a really, really great garden plant. Really, really love it. Great fragrance right now and a good harbinger to, to spring. Okay, I'll do, let's see. Definitely. I'm going into my uh, 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 mushy stuff, as Mark would say. Um, so this is one, uh, it's a rock garden plant probably, but it'll grow in your open garden as well. I'm growing it actually up here on the roof in a container. Uh, this is Stacky's uh, Lavender Folia, oh, Folia, I think the label, I'm missing a few letters on my label. I, la I think it's Lavender Folia. That sounds right. Um, and anyway, so the flowers on this are really cool. Um, it's pink and there's hairy. Uh, and I just looked at our plant. It's about 20 feet from where I'm standing right now. And it's coming into bud right now. Already. Uh, and then last year, it was the first year we had it in the garden and it flowered uh, in the spring. And then it sporadically flowered some in the, the fall as well. Um, it's uh, a very well-drained a plant. that can take very well-drained soils. It's not going to want it wet, but it can take evenly moist soils as well. Full sun uh, is ideal. So that hot, dry spot is a good one for this. Um, uh, and I mean, it, actually, if you were growing the Daphne in the sun, uh, you could probably put it with that. This is an a uh, Asia Minor is where it's from, a Turkey, uh, the Caucasus area. Um, not er terribly high elevation, but uh, it's fuzzy. Look up a picture of this plant. Um, it, it, it's, it's really cool looking. Um, it doesn't look like its cousin, the uh, lamb's ear that you uh, may be more familiar with that self sows everywhere in your garden. Um, <laughs> it, it is much more uh, of a, a, a cool looking plant. It is fuzzy, but in a different way. Uh, the flowers are fuzzy and they're, they're quite uh, good sized actually. And for us, it's gonna be flowering in the next couple, or I'd say in the next three weeks, uh, but it would probably flower April is my guess. Um, and, and then a couple times off and on in the summer. And it supposedly gets up to 12 to 15 inches. Ours, again, I, like I said, was only in the ground last uh, summer and it only got about eight to 10 inches tall. Um, so, but easy to fit in there. Uh, a, a cool one that you don't see very often, especially out here in the Southeast. So. A, a good companion with other things, um, especially up here and with the other. With the, the, the um, Diospyros Texana, it would be perfect with that. And even without flowers, it's got a really nice texture. The leaves, texture. Are, they're, they're, the, the veins on them are oppressed in it. Really it nice, nice. Nice texture um, and a nice kind of silvery green color. Really, yeah. you know, for a mushy plant, this is, this is, <laughs> this is a keeper. Um, really, really nice. So we go from the full blazing sun to the shade. This is Woodwardia uh, orientalis, and this is a crested leaf form. This is just a baby, and I'm not sure I can, they're starting to form crest on them. So uh, this is a fern that can get quite large, actually. This, these are just babies. This, again, it's one of the Woodwardias. It can get like four or five feet tall, actually, the foliage, and six or so feet wide, just from one crown. And uh, when they're on a mature plant. Uh, and then to add to that, they form plantlets on mature leaves, which, I mean, the big leaves like this, there'll be plantlets all over them in the late summer and the fall, which are really cool and you can propagate them for. Hence, we have a handful of these available. But um, we don't have this one in the garden quite yet, as far as I know, or if I don't have a big one yet. It wants an evenly moist spot, ideally. Uh, in our climate, uh, a little protection's not bad here in zone seven. Zone eight south, it's gonna be um, probably even a bit better. When you get about below 10, it can defoliate, for, but it will reflush in the spring. And the crow's ears are just crazy on it uh, when they start to push up. They look really cool. I, I fell in love with this um, after a visit to the Woodland Garden and Atlanta Botanic Garden, where they have this with a lot of other plants kind of in that, uh, in that genre of gardening, but it just has such a nice texture and does really well in that kind of situation with, with other things. Very cool plant. And I have theoretically two left, one to two left. I'll go, I'll, I'll go. So you go. Um, my last one, um, this is Daphne Genqua and doesn't look a lot like, like this Daphne. This is a newer plant to me. I have, um, I hate to, to admit this on camera, but I've killed a bunch of these um, at other gardens. This is one of the finicky Daphnes. Once you have this planted in your garden, moist, well-drained soil, um, a little bit of shade, I think is, is not a bad thing. 
this doesn't like to get its roots disturbed. So plant it someplace where you can kind of let it do its own thing. I don't know if this is as fragrant as the other one. It's ones. not, it doesn't I, have the same I, fragrance. I don't, I don't think it is, but a very unique flower. The odd thing you were saying, you say about root disturbance. One way I've been told to propagate it, or possibly, because we did these by cuttings and I thought it was a miracle um, that we got <laughs> any of them to root. Um, it was do root cuttings. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of ironic that it doesn't like the disturbance, but you can do it from and grow it from root cuttings theoretically. But I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> no, it's, this is this is newer to me. Um, I've purchased these from mail order folks and uh, gotten them from other other garden colleagues, and we've quickly killed them in the garden. We had one in the winter garden when I first started working here, and it was there three or four years at least. It was beautiful. And then all of a sudden, kaput. The, no this is from in that. the Lath House, and we got it several years ago when, um, let's see, it, um, it was, oh, it was, it was a, a native plant nursery, actually, of all things. Um, I, I can't think of the fellow's name. He closed his nursery, but he's the one who told me about the cuttings uh, from the roots. And we planted one in the Lath House, and it's done very well there. Yep. And it's, it's in flower in the Lath House right now, too. This one's been in the nursery, but the other ones in the Lath House is just about the same stage. And it's commonly called lilac flowered. Um, Daphne, and it's very apparent. Uh, you yep. can see that the color. That's, or just even the, how the flower and fluorescence are. Born like a lilac. Uh, the whole stem is covered like a he uh, head of lilac flowers. So. Uh, another another plant collector plant. Yeah, uh, most most definitely. So the one, the next one, I've been doing. I did a plant that was dry. Oh, hold on a Some second, plants. Tim. Somebody's asking oh. why is Don Hackenberry any different than D. Genqua? I don't know that. Don't know that Okay, either. then don't worry about it. I don't know it. who Don Hackenberry no is. No kidding, nope. all right, well, let's um, keep rolling. Daphne, <laughs> but anyways, um, we did a, a dry, some dry plants. This is a wet one. This is uh, a naturally occurring hybrid Saracenia, or pitcher plant. Um, this is Saracenia rubra crossed with Saracenia alata. This is, hence, Ash, Ashley, no, is it Ash, Ashless? Oh, uh, it's A H L E S I I. It's named after some guy whose name starts with that. But anyways, it's a naturally occurring hybrid in uh, Alabama and Mississippi uh, between rubra and um, alata. But uh, so you don't see this one too often. But this one will grow in a bog situation or um, a nice bowl garden. I like to put Saracenias in. If, I, again, I've, everyone probably knows I have an apartment. You can grow anything in a container like that. Um, be, you can even have these at home then. They're, it's zone five hardy, so almost anybody can grow them. It's so remarkable that these, these plants from the southern extremes of our country will grow the whole way up throughout the east coast and through even most of the middle of the country too. So uh, these are just getting growing. And apparently when the spring, when this one's flowers, the flower the head is pink uh, on this one. Uh, and the flowers on all the Cervicenias, they look like they're they're bizarre. They look like spaceships. Yes. Uh, they look alien. Um, I don't even know the morphology on them. But uh, this was just one I wanted. I thought was a cool one to highlight here, so you don't see it every day. Carnivorous plant in, in that realm. Um, if you've ever seen these in the wild, they're they're beautiful. Uh, and like Tim said, if you've got a container, this is a great plant to try. These are nice dried in arrangements mm -hmm. and stuff. Cut flower, I saw some. Recently. Really, really pretty. Um, they have winter interests. All the venation comes out. Uh, an easy plant to go down a rabbit hole of, of liking this, this sort of thing. And they don't need fertilizer. Put them in a bowl of peat. And let them do their thing. And, and I have one last crazy plant. And so um, we had trees, shrubs, herbaceous stuff, and we even have a vine. Uh, this is an herbaceous vine. This is Bomuria edilis. Uh, so this is a kissing cousin of the Alstromeria that you have in that arrangement that you bought for your wife yesterday for Valentine's <laughs> Day. Um, this at the grocery store. At the grocery store, yes, in that last minute when you forgot. Um, so. Uh, Again, this actually has good cut flowers too, but this is a vining cousin of the Ulstromeria. We have a couple, uh, we've had one species in our lath house for years, and we've been trying this one, and it survived last summer. We're gonna see how, it's supposedly zone 7B hardy. For us here, no problem. 
Um, we haven't even had a Zone 7B, or barely Zone 7B winner this year. So, uh, But the flowers on this are kind of a salmon-y shade of soft orange uh, with some, um, or pinky orange, um, almost like the butylone color in reality. Um, so you want to have this somewhere up close. And I was looking online, they recommend it, put it in a container that, where you can have it up close or plant it in the ground. It'll do either way. And it can climb when they get going up six to eight feet tall. So, um, but um, they don't have to have that big of a support to do that. But this was wanting to climb a little bit. We did get some flowers on these. These are some we actually grew from seed, uh, it looks like uh, two years ago. And we've gotten some size to them now. So um, it's just a cool plant. Uh, and I thought, no, well, let's talk about that one. And if it does super well for you, uh, apparently you can eat it. <laughs> so if it starts to take over and uh, uh, you don't want to share it with anybody, you can, you can have a, a dinner out of it. Uh, it's uh, Central and South America is where, uh, America where you find the Bomurias, typically at higher elevations and cloud forests. So they don't always take summer heat, but this has been through our summers, no problem. I've lost other ones in the nursery as well as in the garden, but um, this has stayed uh, and grown for us. So. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Tim and Greg, for pulling yeah. out some of these plants and talking about them a little bit. Everybody, our auction is live now. It went live today at noon and it'll keep on going until one o'clock on Saturday. And I'm sure a good number of you have signed up for the winter symposium. And so we'll all see you on Saturday and you'll be able to bid while you're on your phone in the seat there at the, at the event. So that'll be a lot of fun. So thank you so much for joining us today for this midweek program. We hope you'll join us next week at three o'clock on Wednesday. We're going to be sitting down with Diane Mays from the conservatory at NC State. And Sophia is going to be having a little chit chat with her about that. So we hope you will join us for that. We'll see y'all next week. Take care.